69. Humanism Humanism, having entered into the churches, it soon entered into all of life. The humanistic emphasis of 19th century revivalism soon perverted Christianity into a form of humanism. The catechism was held up to ridicule. Whereas the Westminster Shorter Catechism declares, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, the practical import of religion was increasingly the reverse. God's chief end is to glorify man and to enjoy him forever. The popular literature of the day sang of the glories of man and of God's duty to act as man's faithful ally and servant. It was seen as Christ's duty to judge man on man's own terms. A very popular example of this thesis appeared in Hay's poem, Jim Bloodso of the Prairie Bell. For many years, a much-loved American poem, which still appeared in 20th century school anthologies of poetry, such as Carhartt and McKee's, Through Magic Casements. The author, John Milton Hay, 1838-1905, was Assistant Secretary to Abraham Lincoln, Assistant Secretary of State under President Hayes, Ambassador to Great Britain under McKinley, and Secretary of State under McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt. His poem, Jim Bloodso, sometimes also spelled B-L-U-D-S-O-E, appeared in his Pike County Ballads, 1871. Hay was a key figure of American policy. He was instrumental in establishing the open-door policy in China and in making the Panama Canal a possibility. His poem is of importance, not for any literary merit, for it has little, but as a reflection of an intelligent man's religion in a humanistic society. Bloodso was a riverboat engineer, quote, no saint, end quote, with, quote, one wife in Natchez under the hill and another one here in Pike, end quote. He was a profane man, but no liar. And this was all the religion he had, quote, to treat his engine well, never be passed on the river, to mind the pilot's bell, and if ever the prairie bell took fire, a thousand times he swore he'd hold her nozzle again the bank till the last soul got ashore. The prairie bell grew old, but blood so still refused to be passed. When a Mova star, a better boat, came by, he raced her, with the results being the destruction of the owner's property, the boat, by a fire caused by overfeeding and overpushing the old boat. Bloodso headed the boat to the shore and everyone's life was saved, save Bloodso's, the cause of it all. Bloodso, a profane and godless man, a bigamist, a man who gambled with the lives of the passengers, although they survived, and with the properties of owner and passengers, is still a hero for Hay, who concluded, quote, He weren't no saints, but at judgments, I'd run my chance with Jim, alongside of some pious gentleman that wouldn't shook hands with him. He seen his duty, a dead sure thing, and went for it there and then. And Christ ain't gonna be too hard on a man that died for men. Hay, an urbane and sophisticated man, expressed this humanistic plan of salvation in the affected language of an uneducated and homespun rural American, his idea of Rousseau's pure natural man. Today, Hay's poem is no longer in favour. The need to bring in Christ is no longer there. Man now saves himself on his own terms and without any need of God or Christ. Even more, man now holds that he needs no salvation. He is good as he is, whatever he is, and his only problem is that the Christian religion corrupts him into thinking he is a sinner and that certain acts are sinful. Thus, Alan and Martin hold with Kinsey that all acts capable of being performed are therefore natural, and what is natural is therefore moral. Anal intercourse, homosexuality, incest and other acts are held to be neither, quote, immoral, sick or abnormal, end quote. If there is nothing wrong with man, then man needs no saving unless it is from Christianity because it declares man to be a sinner. For biblical faith, salvation is from sin into the service of God to exercise dominion under him. For humanism, salvation is from the idea of sin and of being a sinner into the glorification and service of man, whatever he is and whatever he does. As Rees, a humanist, declared in 1927, quote, 
Humanism is a conviction that human life is of supreme worth and consequently must be treated as an end, not as a means. This means, in part, Rees declared, quote, Man is not to be treated as a means to the glory of God. The Westminster Catechism said, quote, The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. End quote. This is typical of orthodox theologies. The glory of God is primary. Man is secondary. The result is that today, in most religious circles, man is thought of as only an instrument in the hands of God. The quote-unquote event, likewise, is said to be in the hands of God. End quote. Reese's point is a logical one. Events are either in the hands of God or in the hands of man. Either God is primary or man is. Humanism insists on the ultimacy of man. In Reese's words, quote, Humanism holds to man's nature and essential worth, end quote, as against some eternal worth beyond man. Moreover, quote, Man is not to be treated as a means to cosmic ends, to fix attention on cosmic ends is to weaken one's grasp on the human situation. End quote. This means that man must fix his attention on man without any other standard save man. Neither God nor anything in the universe must be allowed to impose a requirement on man. Quote, the sense of ought, the feeling of responsibility and the like, are producers and instruments of the emotional life of men not authorities to be imposed upon man. End quote. The only ought is what man wills, and not even other men can become a moral imperative for man. Yet, quote, the good of each must become the concern of all. End quote. No man can compel another, and this mutual respect for one another's ultimacy is assumed to be capable of producing quote, mutuality end quote, instead of anarchy. Rees believes that all men should be concerned about all other men. Quote, every hair that is prematurely grey, every claw that falls too soon upon the casket of the dead, every unnecessary sorrow that darkens a human brow weighs upon the conscience of the enlightened man. End quote. This is wishful thinking, because humanism, having posited man's own ultimacy, leads to egoism rather than mutuality. Quote, the primary concern of humanism is human development, end quote. In reality, it becomes the individual man's will, since no moral imperative exists beyond man. Long before Rees, the Marquis de Sade stated the case more clearly for humanism and its moral egoism. Sad, so that humanism requires anarchism and egoism. Polanyi, in discussing personal and political moral nihilism, has said that, quote, The two lines of antinomianism meet and mingle in French existentialism. Madame de Beauvoir heals the Marquis de Sade as a great moralist when Sade declares, through one of his characters, quote, I've destroyed everything in my heart that might have interfered with my pleasures, end quote. And this triumph over conscience, as she calls it, is interpreted in terms of her own Marxism, quote, Sad passionately exposes the bourgeois hoax which consists in erecting class interests into universal moral principles. End quote. Balanyi himself sees no answer except a return to the Enlightenment and its more rational brand of humanism. He does not tell us where such a humanism will find its moral values, moral values which are more than nihilism and more than man. One of the great humanists of history acknowledged that he found his sanity and salvation in recognising the absolute sovereignty of the God who in his grace had chosen him. Nebuchadnezzar wrote, quote, And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honoured him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the time my reason returned unto me, and my counsellors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, 
an excellent majesty added unto me. Daniel 4, 34-36 What Nebuchadnezzar testified to was the absolute sovereignty of God in all things, including his salvation. Quote, None can stay his hand, end quote, that is, quote, none can oppose God's action, end quote. Moreover, Nebuchadnezzar tells us that his reason returned to him when he looked up to God and recognized and acknowledged God's absolute sovereignty. Quote, it is significant that from the Aramaic point of view, quote unquote, reason is manda, knowing, end quote, the beginning of wisdom and knowledge is the fear of the Lord and the recognition of his absolute power and dominion. Moreover, the words of Nebuchadnezzar echo scripture. The following verses are clearly in Nebuchadnezzar's mind. Psalm 105, 13 Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Isaiah forty seventeen. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Isaiah 43, 13 Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Isaiah forty three twenty one. This people have I formed for myself, they shall show forth my praise. There is no reason to suppose that Nebuchadnezzar did not know the Hebrew Scriptures. It was a part of his work to be highly informed about every country he warred against, and his network of spies was a very effective one. As a historical motive force of the Hebrews, the Scriptures would be of a special interest to Nebuchadnezzar, as was also the prophet Jeremiah. In parts, his previous actions were both an interest in and a war against the God of Israel, now he acknowledges him as the only Lord and Saviour of man. Quote, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Daniel 4.37 This is a most telling confession. Because God is absolute and ultimate, all his works are truth and man must conform to God, not God to man. For humanism, logically, all man's works are truth when arising out of his own existential being. For Nebuchadnezzar, all man's works are under the judgment of God, who is alone sovereign. For man the sinner, who is born and who dies, and who comes into a ready-made world for a brief season, to claim priority and ultimacy is indeed humanism, but it is also insanity as all sin is. For anyone to try to confuse Christianity and humanism or to make them one is indeed to sin and is insanity compounded. <laughs>